Dr. George Hillman serves as Vice President for Education and Professor of Educational Ministries and Leadership here at Dallas Theological Seminary. Dr. Hillman came to DTS with years of pastoral experience in church and parachurch organizations in Texas and Georgia. A graduate of Texas A&M University. Okay, gotta always pause there and Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. Dr. Hillman has a passion for education, spiritual formation, and leadership development. He is a rabid college football fan and loves good barbecue. And I just have to stop here and find it very interesting that we have the word rabid and barbecue in the same sentence when referring to Dr. Hillman. He has an encyclopedic knowledge of local barbecue spots. So for all of you prospective students, you have leverage right now to uh, get some good barbecue out of Dr. Hillman. Uh, he is married and they have one adult child who lives in Fort Worth. Will you help me welcome Dr. George Hillman? He told me he was going freestyle on this. Well, let me make sure everybody can see, haha, what this is with the various different things. So, oh, that's not good. But I know as I show this to you, some of you are panicking right now because this is bad memories. You know, this is what happens to you when you go to the driver's license office and they ask you to look at the eye chart. Uh, this eye chart actually has a name. It's called a Snellen chart. 1862, Herman Snellen created this to cause angst in all of your lives. Now, you know the routine as he comes and fixes my thing. You know the routine. You have this at the other end of the, of the hallway or whatever, and you cover one eye, and you're supposed to read as low as you can go on the list. And I was looking at the chart, and this is 2020. I've never read that line a day in my life. I, I could barely read that line being this close. Well, I have a condition where I could have one eye that sees really good. Thank you, man. One eye that sees really good far away, and I have another eye that sees really good close up. So you know what I do. When the doctor says, cover your eye, well, I'm going to cover the eye that doesn't see well far, you know, doesn't see well close up so I can see it. And then I try to memorize the letters. Okay, when I was doing research for this, do you know that there are only nine letters on here? So get my list out here to make sure you know. It is C D E F L O P T Z. I've been calling this a B all my life. So I'm already helping you. You just gotta know those nine letters. So what I would do is I'd cover my eye, the bad eye, be able to see with my good eye, read it, and then memorize it. And then they asked me to cover the other eye, and I'm going off of memory, and oh, I've got 20-20 vision. <laughs> well, now when you go to the doctor's office, you know these are now digital, and they change it. And I'm like, come on, I had this routine down pat. But here's the thing. See, the doctor's trying to help me. He wants to have good, balanced vision. And I need to be able to see far away when I'm driving and seeing street signs, but I also need to be able to see close up when I'm reading a book or uh, reading a magazine article or writing papers for you who are thinking about coming to Dallas Theological Seminary. Balanced eyesight is what the doctor is striving for. And that's a lot about life as well. You've got to have balanced eyesight. You need to be able to see things that are far away, dangers that are coming, but you also need to be able to do close-up work as well. And we're going to talk about having tender eyes and having open eyes. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. If you have a physical Bible, open it up. If you've got a device, I would like for you to scroll, swipe, whatever you need to do to get to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. This is the third chapter in the Sermon on the Mount. Five, six, and seven is Sermon on the Mount. And this is Jesus' inaugural address of this is what life is going to be like in the kingdom. We're 80 verses in now in the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus has covered this amazing breadth of things 
that should be different in our lives because of how we live in the kingdom. So let me just read a couple of these things. It's going to impact our view of money and giving to others. It's going to impact our view of prayer and dependency on the Lord. It's going to impact our view of self-discipline and denial for what is better. It's going to impact our view of worry and anxiety. It's going to impact our view of marriage. It's going to impact our view of truth-telling and removing lies from our life. 80 verses in, Jesus has been hammering this home. And now, as he gets ready to kind of land the plane in the Sermon on the Mount, he brings this illustration about vision. Because when you read that list, you're like, I can't do this on my own. You absolutely cannot do this on your own. This is a heart transformation. But Jesus says it's not just a heart transformation, it is an eye transformation. Because you need to be able to look at the world differently than how you look at the world now. And you need tender eyes and you need open eyes. Matthew chapter seven, verses one and two. Jesus says, judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now, I wanna stop there because I need to set the stage because this is a favorite passage if you watch late night television. Don't judge me, you be you, I'll be me, and we can't bring judgment on anyone. Well, the whole passage is talking about having discernment. So we know that it's not talking about a lack of discernment. What it's talking about is a judgmental attitude. See, now we know from scripture that God is the only judge. He is the judge of the living and dead. That's not my job. That's too big of a task for me to do. But what was happening to the, with these religious leaders that Jesus is addressing is that these religious leaders were placing themselves in the place of God, saying we're going to render a God-like judgment on this person. You know, this word judgment, it can be analyzed, it can be evaluate, judicial litigation, condemnation, revenge. The command here is against self-righteous, haughty superiority, an unmerciful habit of nitpicking criticism and judgmental fault-finding. Jesus wants us to be wise. Jesus wants us to make wise decisions. Jesus wants us to be able to know good and evil, good doctrine, bad doctrine. But you can take it to a place where you are now serving in the role of God, and that is not what your role should be. And if you've ever been on the receiving end of that, have you ever been judged? It hurts. You're like, you don't know my situation, you don't know, and you've made a judgment call on me and you don't really know me. Man, that's social media right now. Have you seen the political ads? I, it's on TV. It creeps into our work relationships. It creeps into the people I love most, my family, where I become judgmental towards them without hearing them out. That's what this passage is talking about in verses one and two. So I have a list here real quick of how do I know when I've slipped from having discernment, which is the rest of this passage, and being judgmental. Let me just read a couple of these to you. Am I more enraged about someone else's sin than I am embarrassed about my own sin? Do I refuse to forgive? Do I cut off those who disagree with me? I'd rather gossip about your sin than coming directly to you to confront you about your sin. I refuse to receive criticism of myself and I write off somebody as hopeless. Now we'll talk about at the end, there are people that we need to know that we maybe need to walk away because this is not a good situation, but no one is hopeless. And I am so quick to write off people the passage continues on in here and it says, the measure you use will be measured to you. See, when I usurp God's place of judgment, guess what? I had better be ready to be judged by the same measure that I'm using towards other people. And I don't want to be judged that way. So why in the world would I judge people in that same way? That's verses one and two. So I've spent a lot of time there kind of setting the stage because the rest of the passage talks about wisdom. 
and how to discern wisely. And again, tender eyes and open eyes. Let's read verses three and four. It says, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how will you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? Speck and log, let's talk about those two things. A speck here, it's, it's more than just a piece of dust. It could be a small twig, it could be a piece of hay. It hurts, even a piece of dust, it hurts. I don't wanna be walking around with a speck in my eye. And I don't know if you've ever tried to remove something out of your eye hard. I'd say it's almost impossible. I need somebody to come alongside me to help get this thing out of my eye. So the passage is saying, well, it's great to walk around with a speck in your eye. No, we want to get specks out of each other's eye, but we want to do it in the proper way. Log, or if you have, maybe your translation might say beam of wood. This is a load bearing timber that's holding up the roof of a house. It's more than just a piece of firewood and it's hyperbole and Jesus is a carpenter and he's using some wood humor in this. But he says, you're walking around with this giant beam of wood in your own eye. That's not helpful. This other person has a speck. They need you to help them and no one's doing each other any good. And he says, what you need to do first is you probably need to take that chunk of wood out of your own eye so that you can then help out the other person. See and notice, you'll see that there of see and notice. See means, I literally see it. I see that you have a speck in your eye. That word notice, it's only used here in the book of Matthew, one time. It is perception. I'm not perceiving that I have a log in my eye, but I know I do. And we'll talk about this in just a little bit. You have one too, and let me tell you, Everyone knows your log. Everyone can name your log. You think you're hiding it. Trust me, I can ask my staff right now as I see them there, they can name the log that's in my eye because they know it. My wife, my daughter can name the log that's in my eye. Your friends, your family, they know it. And you think you're trying to hide it. And what we wanna do is we wanna deal with the log. I wanna help you out with the spec so that everybody can be healthy and can be well. So let's keep going. Verse five, Jesus says, you hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will clearly see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Now, if you are reading along in the Sermon on the Mount, you're going to hear this word hypocrite used several times. And all the previous times, it is Jesus talking about those leaders, those leaders are hypocrites in how they give money. And everybody else says, yeah, those hypocrites, those religious leaders, they're terrible at what they do. And those hypocrites and how they fast, yeah, those hypocrites, they're terrible in how they do this. And Jesus now turns the phrase and he says, oh, by the way, you're a hypocrite too. And you could hear a pin drop at the Sermon on the Mount at that point. Because I am really good at playing the role of the hypocrite. I am really good at pointing out your speck and I'm not really good at dealing with the stuff that's in my own life. I said you could name your log. Let me throw out some names. Pride, anger, envy, greed, gluttony, lust, sloth. Name it, claim it, but deal with it because you're not able to help others when you're not dealing with your own log. And what Jesus is doing, he's simply pointing out our human tendency. I have a tendency, you have a tendency to, dis, to, to discount what happens in our own lives and focus solely on the other person. We have grossly selective perception. We're not very good at the eye chart. It says, see clearly. The passage, what it's talking about is, I wanna be able to see clearly, why? Because I wanna help you. I wanna help get that speck out of your eye. Because I know that's painful, I know it's hurting, and I wanna be able to come alongside and help you. And the only way I can do it is if I deal with my own junk so that I can see clearly to come alongside you to help you. And he says, brother, 
And we're gonna include sisters in this as well. This is the language of family. This is what family does. If I've got something and you're my family, it's unloving for you not to say something to me. You don't want me to look foolish. You don't want me to be embarrassed. You want what's best for me. And I want what's best for my family as well. So all throughout here, it's brother, it's sister. This is language of family that's used here. Matthew 18, 15. If your brother, or we'll include sister in this, sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. And if he listens, you've gained your brother. I'm not doing this to cause animosity between us. I'm doing this because we've got a relationship. You're my brother, you're my sister, and I want what is best for you. And it says that we're to restore with gentleness. Galatians 6, 1 says, brothers and sisters, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness, keeping watch over yourself lest you become tempted. When you go to weddings, you hear 1 Corinthians 13 and wedding and you know, love is patient, love is kind. You know that it's talking about the family relationship in the context of the local church. And with that twist, love is patient. Love is kind. Love doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. It's not arrogant. It's not rude. It doesn't insist on its own way. It's not irritable. It's not resentful. It doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing, but it rejoices with truth. Hey, you've got a speck in your eye. Hey, I got a log in my eye. Let's deal with both of these things because when we have truth, we have love. Love bears all things, love believes all things, love hopes all things, and love endures all things. This is what Jesus is saying. I love you enough as a brother and sister that I want to take that speck out of your eye. And I know in the future, you're gonna need to take a speck out of my eye too, and I'm inviting you into my life so that you can do that. That is what biblical community is all about about. And why do we struggle in churches today? Because we don't have that biblical community. We don't let people get close to, to us enough. Now, sometimes when I got a giant beam coming out of my, my eye, I kind of knocking people around. I can't even get close to people. I got to deal with the log in my own eye so I can have the ability to get close to you in relationship and to build trust. I want to help you, and I know there's going to be a time in the future when you're going to need to help me, and you are my brother, and you are my sister, and we are in this together. In his commentary on Sermon on the Mount, Kent Hughes puts it this way, and I want to just read this quote to you. He says, we then see ourselves as we are, and we see others as they are. Instead of being critical, we weep for ourselves and for them. When we have removed the log from our own eye, then we can see clearly to take the speck out of our brother's or sister's eyes. Jesus does not encourage a laissez-faire attitude towards fellow believers. Jesus does want us to discern the sins and shortcomings in others, but he wants us to see them through clear, self-judged eyes, eyes that are tender and compassionate. The procedure for removing a speck from an eye is very difficult and delicate. There's nothing in the human body more sensitive than the eye. The instant you touch it, it closes up. And what is required for clearing an eye is gentleness, carefulness, patience, and sympathy for the other person. In the spiritual realm, the care is even more delicate for the soul. That's the most sensitive person of the part of a human being. We must be humble, sympathetic, conscious of our own sins and without condemnation. We need God's mercy. We need to be people who speak truth and love because the love of God controls us. So eye chart, eye exam, cover up one of the eyes. How's that tender eye doing? Are you quick to judge? Or are you dealing with your own junk so that you can enter into a person's life to help them and come alongside. I'm not very good at that. And I know lots of us struggle with that. And that's why you're here. Well, we're gonna switch eyes and we're gonna keep reading because you need a tender eye, but you also need an open eye. Verse six, 
Do not give dogs what is holy and do not throw your pearls before pigs lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Now this is a unique verse in the gospels. It's probably uh, you know, a, a parable type of saying. Uh, we find in extra biblical re, uh, 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 resources that you will find that type of thing of pigs and dogs being used together. Let me just be real clear that what this is not talking about, this is not an anti-evangelism passage at all. Because at the very end of Matthew, guess what we have? We have the Great Commission. And this is a gospel that's going to go out to the entire world. This is the counterbalance on our eye test. Dogs and holy things. Now I got a cute little 15 pound dog, Lucy. She's a Havanese and she sits in my lap and those types of things. That's not what we're talking about here. Dogs in Jesus's times, they roamed the streets and they ate the scraps of food. They were seen as unclean, wild, even dangerous animals. And it says, don't give the dog what is holy. No Jewish person in Jesus' time would have taken meat that had been sacrificed in the temple and been consecrated and would have given it to a dog. That just doesn't make any sense at all. You don't give the holy things to things that are unholy. Pigs and pearls. This is not Porky Pig. This is not Wilbur from Charlotte's Web. This is not even Babe. This is a wild boar. And you think dogs are bad? Pigs were even more seen as unclean and they were dangerous and they would ravage your gardens. Pearls, pearls were the most precious thing in the first century. More valuable than diamonds, more valuable than gold. And a pig doesn't appreciate a pearl. A pig wants the food that you gave, the unholy food that you gave to the dog. That's what the pig wants. And you give the pig a pearl and the pig doesn't know what to do with the pearl and it just tramples on it. And Jesus is saying, you need tender eyes, but you know what? You need an open eye too. Because there's some times that we are giving holy things to people who have no respect for what is holy. The dogs represent the vicious scorn for and opposition of the gospel message. And the pigs, at best it's blissful ignorance and at worst it's a hardened contempt for the gospel message. I wanna be very clear here. In, in Jesus talking about pigs and talking about dogs, he is not speaking at all about the worth of the individual. And what we're gonna talk about in just a second has nothing to do with the worth of the individual. But there are some people who reject the gospel message. There are some, even in your own family, that you try to have this spiritual conversation and they want nothing to do with it and they would go even further. They will mock you, they will scorn you and you dread going home at Thanksgiving and Christmas because you're like, I'm gonna have to go through all this all over again. Sometimes we need open eyes to know when it's time to speak and when it's time to maybe walk away. I wanna read this passage from apologist Greg Kokel. It's, uh, this comes out of an article called Stop the Steamroller. This is great stuff. He says, not everyone deserves an answer. It's not that Jesus saw people as beasts. No, I think he was warning us to be circumspect with people who act in a beastly manner when they're offered the pure and precious grace of God. Sometimes wisdom dictates that we keep our distance and ration our efforts. Knowing when to step back requires the ability to separate the dogs and the hogs from the lost sheep looking for a shepherd. Few people readily admit their belief is wrong. Some put up a real fight, even when your points are reasonable and your manner is gracious. Once in a while, you will encounter people who try to overpower you. They don't overwhelm you with facts and arguments. They roll over you with their force of personality. Their challenges come quickly, one after another, keeping you from collecting your wits and giving a thoughtful answer. Steamrollers have a defining characteristic. They constantly interrupt. As soon as you try to respond, they hear something they don't like. They break in, they pile on one objection after the other or challenge after challenge. And if you go down the new rabbit hole, they interrupt again, changing the subject and firing new challenges and never really listening to anything you say. If this sounds familiar, 
you've been steamrolled. If a steamroller won't let you answer, listen politely until he finishes and then drop it. Let him have the satisfaction of having the last word. That's the gracious thing to do, yet it communicates confidence. And then shake the dust off your feet and move on. Wisdom dictates not wasting time with this type of person. Be generous with the truth. But sometimes people will show utter contempt for the precious gift being offered. They will simply trample it in the mud and then viciously turn on you. If you sense someone pawing the turf, ready for the charge, it may be time to leave. Don't waste your efforts. Save your energy for more productive encounters. Say something like, it seems to me this conversation isn't going in a productive direction. I'm going to let you have the last word, but then I'm moving on. Or, I'm having a hard time getting my point across, so I think it's better to just let this go right now. Thanks for your thoughts. Dealing with a steamroller is rarely smooth and a tidy experience. When you encounter verbal abuse from unbelievers, don't take it personally. It's not about you, it's about Jesus. And when you falter, don't get discouraged. Take it as a learning experience for the next time around and move on. Occasionally, the wisest course of action is to bow out graciously. As I said earlier, not everyone deserves an answer. Which eye am I supposed to use? This doesn't make any sense. Am I supposed to use my tender eye? Am I supposed to use my open eye? Every person's different and it takes wisdom. And I'll even tell you this, the pig or dog in your life might be an open field for someone else. I'm not everyone's savior. I'm not, and I want to be. I want to help everybody. I am not everyone's savior. I present the gospel. I present the message, but there are times when I need to just trust in the Lord's hand that the Lord has this person. The Lord cares for this person more than I do, and I know the Lord is going to do what is best in this situation. It's a funny thing with Facebook. I look at people on Facebook who I knew in high school. Oh, trust me, I knew them in high school. And they're some of the most committed followers of Jesus now. And I'm like, I wouldn't have given a nickel for you back in high school. And there's other people who I grew up in the youth group that want nothing to do with Jesus now. I don't know which eye to use. It takes wisdom because you can't do this on your own. So I want to talk specifically for the folks who are here that are thinking about seminary. There's a God story that each one of you is wrestling with right now. There's a reason why you took off work to come here. Some of you traveled to come here to Dallas Theological Seminary. There's a God story. And I guarantee we could sit down and have a God story and hear your journey that you've been on. But one of the things I want to tell you is that this is probably why you're coming. You're like, I need to know how to No, what do I need to do in this situation? I'll tell you three things, and this goes for everybody. This is a great place to deal with your log. It's a great place to deal with your log. I've had conversations here at Dallas Theological Seminary that I've not even had in my church. This is a great place to deal with the log because we wanna deal with the log here now because if you get out of here and you haven't dealt with your log, guess what? You're gonna cause a lot of damage. So whether you decide to come to Dallas Theological Seminary or another seminary, you need to be in biblical community because you need to deal with the log because we all have the log. The second thing I will tell you is that you're here because you want to develop tender eyes so that you can love well. This is hard work being in ministry and whatever it's going to be. Some of you are going to be senior pastors, missionaries, counselors, artists, whatever the case may be, but you're all going to be working with people. People are messy and it's hard work and you need to be in biblical community so that you can develop tender eyes, but you also need to be in biblical community because you need to grow in your wisdom. Some of you are too naive. I know I am. and, And I've got to build up and know wisdom to know Is this worth a fight? 
fighting for or do I need to walk away? That's the mark of wisdom. And you learn that being in biblical community. And for the folks who are here in this room, you are on that journey. I know you're on that journey as you're wrestling with classes, as you're in your spiritual formation groups, as you are connecting with faculty members and you're having these types of conversations. We want you to be able to have good sight out of both eyes because balance is the key. Let's pray. Father, we come before you today with humble hearts, seeking your wisdom and guidance. Teach us to see others through your eyes. Lord, teach us not to judge others harshly, remembering the grace and mercy that you have shown to us. Help us to see our brothers and sisters through your eyes of love, compassion, understanding that we too are in need of your forgiveness. Teach us discernment, to recognize our own faults when we speak in others' shortcomings. May your Holy Spirit guide us in examining our hearts, leading us to repentance and transformation. Let our words and actions be rooted in love, aiming to build up rather than tear down and to encourage rather than discourage. Grant us the wisdom to know when to speak and when to be silent, to share your truth with gentleness and respect. Help us be mindful of the sacredness of your word and the gospel and not casting it aside because it is holy and it is a thing that is precious. And Father, unfortunately, because we live in a fallen world, some people just do not appreciate it. In all things, Lord, may your will be done. Teach us to walk in your ways, reflecting your love and grace to those around us. Strengthen us to be the beacons of your light in this world, guiding others to a saving knowledge of your son, Jesus Christ. And we do pray these things in the powerful name of your son and in the power of your Holy Spirit.